happy Tuesday, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to today's Portage Global Water Futures webinar entitled Look Before You Leap, Adventures in Curating and Preserving Research Data. My name is Jennifer Abel. I am the training coordinator for the Portage Network. And I'd like to begin today by now speaking to you from the traditional ancestral and unceded lands of the Coast Salish people, namely the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the tsleil -Waututh. This is the fifth webinar in our co-presented series with Global Water Futures. This series aims to educate researchers and data professionals across Canada on research data management best practices and tools that are available to support them. These webinars will help participants navigate the evolving RDM landscape as fu funders, publishers, and the research community increasingly require good RDM practices. In today's webinar, we're going to be looking at data deposit and curation, which means making decisions now that will impact prospects for preservation into the future. How can we best prepare our data for a leap into the unknown? In this webinar, data curation expert Shahira Kerr and digital preservationist Grant Hurley join forces to show how decisions made at the time of data upload and curation impact the ability to preserve data for the long term. We'll learn introductory concepts in digital curation and preservation for research data, and how choices around what, digital what data files to keep, the level of descriptive metadata, and other contextual information, and the use of preservation-friendly file formats can help support or harm the prospects of data remaining accessible and usable later. A couple of housekeeping things before we start. You have been muted automatically when you enter the room. This webinar is being recorded and the chat may be archived for those who are, un are unable to attend. We encourage you to use the latest version of Zoom so that you have access to all the, the features, including security updates. But if you don't have it right now, wait until after the webinar to go and update. Please use the chat feature if you're having technical difficulties or have additional resources you'd like to share. And please use the Q&A option to ask any questions that you might have. We'll be ad addressing questions at the end. You can also raise your hand if you wish to ask a question. Questions may be asked in English or French. We do abide by the CARL Code of Conduct here, which you can find at the web address on your screen, which will also be in the chat shortly. CARL and the Portage Network are committed to providing a welcoming, safe, and harassment-free environment for staff, membership, committees, and working groups, as well as for participants, speakers, and organizers of CARL meetings and events. We do not tolerate harassment of any kind. Our presenters today for this webinar, Shahira Kerr is a data curation librarian at the University of Victoria Libraries, where she supports students and research in, researchers in adopting data management practices and publishing their research data. She is currently seconded to Canada's new digital research infrastructure organization as a senior analyst to support assessment and strategic planning initiatives. Shahira also serves as chair of the Portage Research Intelligence Expert Group. And Grant Hurley is the Digital Preservation Librarian at Scholars Portal, the Information Technology Service Provider for the Ontario Council of University Libraries. He oversees the maintenance of the Scholars Portal Trustworthy Digital Repository and coordinates the permafrost-hosted digital preservation service for OCL members. Grant serves as a member of the CARL Digital Preservation Working Group and the Portage Preservation Expert Group. So you are in excellent hands in this webinar today, and I will now hand over the digital pixelated floor to Shahira and Grant. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jennifer. I'm just going to share my screen. All right. How's this look? Do you see a slide with a horse? I do. <laughs> Great. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, so thanks so much for having us. Um, I'm really happy to be here. I appreciated the invitation from Portage, from Beth, uh, Jennifer, and Jennifer's uh, predecessor, Melanie, to put on this webinar. Um, and thank you so much to my co-presenter, Shahira, uh, for agreeing to come along with me. Um, I, I, love, I love talking about preservation, but I sometimes feel that conversations around research data preservation um, happen a bit in isolation from other parts of the research data workflow. So. This is an opportunity to, to bring these conversations together. So this is us. Uh, you already heard uh, our introductions, but here's some friendly smiling faces yet again. Um, and we do have some land acknowledgments we'd like to state before we begin. So for myself, um, 
I'm currently located in Tecoronto, or otherwise known as Toronto, which is the tr traditional territory of many nations, including the Sasagas with the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. It's home to many First Nations, uh, Inu Inuit and Métis peoples today. Um, and Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Williams Treaty signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. Hi everyone, I'm speaking uh, from Victoria, which is uh, located on unceded Coast Salish territory. Um, and specifically, I, I live and work on the lands of the Lekwungen, Esquimalt, and Wasanich peoples, who have long-standing relationships to the land that continue to this day. Okay, so here's what we're hoping to, to do today in this webinar. Um, first of all, we want to introduce you to some key concepts in digital curation and preservation and what these words mean, essentially. Um, and then the key part, understanding how choice is made um, when you're curating data for deposit can improve or possibly harm the prospects of the data's uh, preservation into the future. Um, and finally, we want to identify small but impactful ways to improve the reusab re reusability of data sets both now and the future as well. I'm going to talk about um, how reusability does um, in many ways inform um, preservation as well. And those two things can be nicely linked together. To start though, I'm going to talk about um, this idea of like digital fragility. Um, essentially, I mean, there's lots of ways people talk about digital preservation um, culturally and um, socially. Um, sometimes we hear this discourse around how if you put something on the, on the internet, it'll be there forever. Um, it'll come back to haunt you on Facebook or something like that. Um, on the other side, sometimes people talk, talk about like a digital dark age where nothing is going to be kept <laughs> because of the instability of, um, of the internet and other sorts of digital storage devices. And the reality is somewhere in between. Um, so on the photo on the left, this is a picture of a five and a quarter inch floppy disk, which I imagine few of you are using today. Um, and on the right, I love this um, XKCD comic about how these sort of dependencies around digital objects um, are constantly changing. And so losing access to something because a site is down or no longer accessible, or you no longer have access to, you know, the CD drive that you used to use for your, your you know, encyclopedias on CD. These are all like realities of digital objects. I um, mean, so, oops, I just clicked on the link. <laughs> Um, so there's this idea that overall, though, of digital fragility, um, and it's, it's kind of placed in a few different um, areas in a way. Um, of course, we've got media that can um, degrade and age over time. You know, materials like floppy disks or hard drives are mechanical, and physical in nature. Um, and so they do age and eventually become unusable after a certain point. Um, and then there are these many layers of mediation between the physical data thing, like the, uh, the physical data object, wherever it may be stored, and you, the user. So we've got the storage medium, which again can be um, removable, like an external hard drive, a USB stick, floppy disk, um, or it could be on a network drive or located in some server somewhere. Then there's the operating file system. Um, after that are things like file formats and character encodings software applications, and then finally, like the display, we're actually interacting with that digital object. And all those layers require different types of maintenance. Um, you know, they're either updated and maintained or not um, by whoever has taken responsibility for them. Um, and the job of, uh, of preservation is to try and sort of navigate between all these different layers to maintain access to things over time. Um, the other side of it too is that digital objects can be easily deleted, which is a disadvantage. Um, it's like much easier to delete something than it is to like throw a physical object out in some ways. Um, they can easily be corrupted as well, either through transfer or aging storage media or some other you know, unintended edit. But the beautiful thing about them too is that they can be easily copied, so much more easily kept in different places than physical materials. And you can more easily check them to ensure that nothing's really changed about that object over time. So there's pros and cons to, to the digital world like anything else. So this kind of brings us to another aspect of digital fragility and digital preservation, which is the need for stewards who make long-term commitments to keeping data accessible. So um, somebody somewhere does have to make a commitment to keeping something over time. Um, and that could be well-known memory institutions like archives, 
libraries, um, you know, data, data archives, for example, become a specialization. Um, but as well, you know, platforms like GitHub, for example, which maintain code um, and have taken a, something of a commitment to keeping um, at least that code available, if not necessarily usable over time. There are also broad definitions in the community around the role of responsible stewards. And these have been coded in um, the FAIR and trust principles, um, and spe specifically for research data. And we'll talk a bit about these a bit more, but um, the basic kind of takeaway here is that um, these sorts of um, sets of principles are starting to define what um, stewards should do over the long term and um, link them as well with certification standards like Core Trust Seal or ISO 16363, which actually assess repositories against a set of criteria um, for their ability to keep things, um, digital things alive over time. So I'll turn it over to Shahira to talk about the RDM lifecycle. Thanks, Grant. Um, yeah, so I think many of you on this call would be familiar with the research data lifecycle, but for those of you who aren't, um, it effectively is a way to conceptualize uh, stages that data moves through as it's being managed over a given investigation from the start of a project with planning and data capture uh, to the end of a project with uh, a publication of, of data or sharing um, and then preservation as well. Um, of course, in reality, uh, these uh, are not always discrete stages. Aspects of these functions can be you know, non-sequential and overlapping throughout an investigation. Um, but in the context of, of this webinar, we wanted to first uh, define where curation and, and preservation uh, fit into this life cycle, um, at least as in the context of this webinar, um, just so you can more specifically know what we're talking about when, you, when we refer to these uh, two terms. So next slide, Grant. Yeah, so I think especially data curation uh, is a super broad term and can mean a lot of things. Um, you know, at its most broad definition, it can refer to the active management of, of research data across its life cycle. Um, but specifically in, in this webinar, um, by curation, I'm going to be referring specifically to actions taken at the end of uh, a project. Um, when data are packaged um, for uh, reproducibility uh, and, uh, and sharing to promote reusability uh, as well. Um, curation at this stage anyways is generally done uh, to support uh, the FAIR principles, which Grant mentioned earlier. Uh, and the FAIR principles um, are uh, findability, accessibility, uh, interoperability, and reusability, and they're kind of principles that are designed to uh, guide um, actions taken towards improving um, the likelihood of uh, data reuse and, and quality um, over time. Um, and increasingly, the, the work of data curation um, at the kind of sharing phase of an investigation takes place in the context of, of supporting infrastructure like a data repository. So next slide. So just to give you a sense of what uh, a data curator's day might, might look like um, and kind of broad strokes, um, it might involve uh, consultations uh, with researchers. Uh, so at the moment, for me anyways, this primarily revolves around deposit to uh, our library's uh, data repository. Um, and that's primarily for researchers um, taking place at the end of a, a project. So when they are looking to fulfill requirements from uh, publishers or funding agencies to, to share their data. Of course, we would more and more like to encourage more upstream collaboration uh, via partnerships on grants, for example, or through support for data management plans so that uh, those sorts of consultations uh, and decisions take place earlier on in a project. Um, as well, um, in a typical day, you might be auditing data sets that are being prepared for deposit to a repository or that have already been submitted uh, to a repository. And then also depending on the relationship you might have with uh, the researchers, um, you might be involved in, in light or more heavy lifting uh, to prepare data sets uh, for deposit uh, with the goal of, uh, again, improving those FAIR principles. Um, and so this, those actions could include uh, organizing um, files for a better uh, accessibility and, uh, and discoverability, uh, creating uh, needed documentation or metadata 
uh, implementing uh, metadata standards uh, if they exist, um, and then applying persistent IDs to uh, related objects um, related to that data set. Next. Yeah, so um, later on in the cycle and the way that it's often represented and imagined is digital preservation work, the work of preserving data. Um, and so the Digital Preservation Coalition has a, has a definition for digital preservation, which is the series of managed activities necessary to ensure continued access to digital materials for as long as necessary. Um, so it's, it's a pretty straightforward definition, really. It's like, what do you need to do in order to maintain access into the future? Um, and so we can link to things like the FAIR principles here, um, but the FAIR principles don't actually specifically point to preservation. It's almost kind of like assumed um, in a way that, that preservation sort of supports those broad goals of findability, um, accessibility, reusability, and so on. So, you know, what does this actually mean in practice? Um, broadly, the goal of any kind of preservation program is to ensure that you're um, improving the preservation prospects of data into the future using a, a wide variety of strategies. Um, I want to uh, cite my colleague Steve Marks here for this idea of preservation prospects. He often talks it about being kind of like a meter from red to green. Um, and so whatever you're doing as a preservationist is trying to keep the needle in the green area as far as um, improving the prospects of that data's preservation. Um, sometimes you might think, do things that have to like tip it more towards the red. Um, if that means, for example, converting a format um, that doesn't have an exact sort of like one-to-one -one relationship with that original, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and of course, in doing so, you're also trying to ensure that users, your research community, um, can access those preserved materials in the form that's best suited to their needs, which may not be the same from um, group to group. Um, at the same time, you're monitoring and mitigating any preservation risks that you can identify um, while also doing no harm to the materials being preserved. Um, the principle of kind of do no harm is one that um, is, you know, kind of inherited from analog preservation. Never do something you can't undo. <laughs> um, and in the case of digital preservation, like, you know, try not to delete things is a good one. Um, <laughs> and any other kind of transformations for which you might, you know, that might be the only copy. So on a day-to-day -day basis, um, a digital preservationist is um, developing and documenting preservation policies and workflows. Um, so broad sets of, of things that your organization is committing to do when it comes to preservation, as well as more specific step-by-step -step approaches for particular content types. Um, they're creating and verifying checksums, which is sort of the like um, one of the key building blocks of any preservation workflow. A checksum is an algorithm that can be run against any particular file. It'll spit out um, ideally unique code. Um, and the beautiful thing about a checksum is that if you change the file, um, go in and edit it, um, the checksum will change. And so you can use these checksums and the records basically to validate files from one point to the next. So if I put a file in preservation storage and run a checksum on today, and I have that, I record that code. I run that checksum check again in a year or two years, five years, 10 years, and that checksum remains unchanged, the code remains unchanged, then I know that that files retain integrity. So I can be assured that the materials have, have remained safe. So we're doing that all the time. Um, at the same time, we're gathering and structuring descriptive rights, administrative and technical metadata to inform and support preservation. So this is knowledge about um, things like file formats, um, any other sort of embedded metadata. Um, information about the context of files and how they could be made accessible and usable. Um, ideally, all this information is structured and kept alongside the materials that you're looking to preserve. Um, the example, the images on the right there, um, a file called passage.bk exclamation mark. What is that? Um, my Apple computer doesn't, doesn't know. Um, but using file format identification tools, I can find out it's actually a WordPerfect 5.1 file. And then using other tools, I can actually open it up in a version of WordPerfect, um, which is to me super fun. <laughs> um, so that's where we get into access questions as well. So migrating and normalizing files um, where required into different formats, both for preservation purposes and access purposes. So in the case of this WordPerfect file, um, you might be turning it into a PDF that's more suitable for a broad user, but some users may also want to access it in its original form. Um, and so that's when you use something like an emulation strategy, and I'll talk about that in a second as well. 
Finally, um, you're thinking about storing your preservation package, the data that you want to keep, as well as metadata about it in a preservation friendly storage environment, um, ideally with multiple geographically separate copies um, that again are being checked with those checksums between them. There are also lots of um, interesting developing research areas and services around complex data objects um, like emulation, software preservation, web archiving, all sorts of stuff. So there's lots of things to, to keep on top of. But these are three kind of key strategies for doing digital preservation work. Um, one of them is uh, bit level preservation, which is really just checking those checksums. Um, but no, there's no commitment to really ensuring files are still accessible at like a format level. Um, and so bit level preservation is sort of the most basic type. Um, and it may be suitable for some materials, um, but uh, if you need more assurances, then that's when you get into the area of normalization and migration. Um, normalization is when you're converting files to preservation formats on receipt. So as you receive them into your workflow, uh, migration is when you do that change later on, perhaps when those files um, are at greater risk. Um, and those are two sort of differing approaches, depending on kind of the resources you have, the level of risk you're comfortable with. Um, and finally, emulation is what I mentioned before. It's when you're maintaining access to original files and the originating software and possibly the operating systems um, that they ran on. Um, and then you run them together inside a concurrent computing system so that you can run WordPerfect 5.1 inside a you know, modern Mac operating system um, and then interact with the file as it would have been interacted with in the past, um, which is definitely fun, but more resource intensive. And so um, with any sort of digital objects, um, these different sorts of, of levels are, are possible. So with that kind of overview of, of preservation um, and curation, um, differences in terms of their considerations. For the remainder of the, the presentation, uh, we wanted to prompt a uh, discussion of how uh, curation and preservation are, are linked um, using a series of, of four scenarios in a choose your own adventure format. Um, and I don't know if anyone on the webinar is familiar with Bandersnatch, but it's probably the most like contemporary example of a choose your own um, adventure story, which were super popular in the 90s. Um, and we thought about doing this like more literally in the presentation, um, where like we would take um, viewers down like different paths depending on like choices made, which of course, you know, does reflect reality. But as we were creating the scenarios, we kind of realized that there weren't really right or wrong um, answers. So what we're going to do is, is present four scenarios um, and um, present a series of choices, but then talk about um, kind of underlying principles uh, guiding decisions uh, behind those choices um, and hopefully show that uh, decisions made in curation um, will have kind of longer term impacts on, on preservation. So next slide. Oh yeah, now we're gonna jump right in. We're diving in. <laughs> Do that. Okay, uh, so the first scenario um, takes into consideration selection of file formats. So um, imagine uh, you're a curator and you receive an email from a graduate student to uh, deposit their data set from a recently published mixed method study. Um, and they have the green light to share their materials from their university's research ethics board. And so they attach to their email uh, their data set, uh, which is a .nvp file. Uh, which is uh, corresponds to uh, an NVivo uh, workspace. Um, and for those of you who uh, may not be familiar with NVivo, uh, NVivo is, is qualitative data analysis software, uh, which is widely used in curating and analyzing uh, qualitative data. Um, and it allows researchers to identify and connect themes that are found in different uh, qualitative uh, data objects. Um, it's proprietary software, but luckily uh, your institution provides licenses. So you're able to open the file um, and you find that the workspace is super well curated. So within NVivo, all of the files and folder structures are really well named and organized. Uh, the data are linked and interpretable uh, in their original context. Um, and then uh, corresponding to requirements from the research ethics board, data are fully anonymized. So, as the curator, would you uh, recommend keeping the original file format? Or given that it's a proprietary format, would you uh, con uh, consider exporting to alternate file formats? 
So um, in terms of deciding whether to keep data in the original or native uh, file format, uh, or choosing to transform into alternate file formats, that has implications on the, the fairness of, of your data. Um, and there's a range of trade-offs depending on, on that choice. So the benefits of keeping data in uh, the native file format are that uh, it typically would retain the original quality and context in which the data were created and analyzed. And that can support reproducibility and reusability depending on the software that it was created in. So in the specific context of in vivo, there's lots of internal connectivity um, between um, the different objects. Um, and there's lots of uh, internal metadata and documentation that's created by that software surrounding that data. Um, but because it's proprietary software, there is you know, reduced accessibility um, and interoperability um, for reusers who may not have access to Anivo. It's actually quite an expensive piece of software. Um, and then it may not be interoperable with other pieces of software that a reuser might want to um, export data into and, and analyze. Yeah, and so when we're talking about um, preservation of a format uh, like this as well, um, it's difficult to guarantee um, accessibility of that file into the future. Um, so usually archivists and others often will keep the original file format, even if it's not accessible. Um, again, with that sort of do no harm principle, maybe there'll be other tools built in the future to access that file, if not now. Um, and so you generally don't delete it um, if it is decided to be kept. Um, but because of that sort of like difficulty in that, in, in maintaining software, um, particularly proprietary software, um, it, it's, you can't guarantee that it'll always be, always be accessible. Um, that said, if the preserver is feeling really motivated, um, they could commit to maintaining that original software if they have the rights to do so, including the specific version, because um, different versions of software do often perform quite differently. Um, and again, that's like if the resources are available and if, if it's technically possible. Um, the other interesting thing um, was that when Shahir actually picked this file format, I didn't realize it, but it wasn't documented in Pronom, which is the um, UK archives, um, uh, essentially encyclopedia of file formats. And Pronom forms the basis of a lot of the work that preservationists do in, in identifying file formats. Um, it's a community effort, so there are gaps in Pronom for sure. Um, and maybe this could be the subject of, um, of documentation work in the future. Um, but if you were to run uh, this in vivo you know, package file basically through a file format identification tool, it currently wouldn't be able to be identifiable. So that's also a disadvantage for preservation purposes. So when uh, considering uh, then exporting um, the data out of uh, proprietary format to an alternate format, um, by alternate, I'm, I'm primarily thinking about more open file formats. Um, again, there are uh, trade-offs and benefits to consider. So obviously there's benefits of increased accessibility um, and that you know, matters in terms of sharing data, providing more access to it and, and more reusability. Um, however, it's also important to recognize that there are risks um, of perhaps loss of information during that transformation process. Um, and then just thinking back to all of the kind of contextualization and, and metadata that might exist within that um, proprietary software, um, it can be really time consuming to, to recreate all of that um, outside of the original software. And in some instances, it might not actually be feasible to, to do so. Um, on the flip side, so if you are you know, exporting to well-known documented file formats, uh, open file formats um, with consistent standards, it's much easier to preserve them. <laughs> it just makes, makes life easier. So UTF-8 encoded CSV or tab files are like, oh, great, so delightful. <laughs> um, however, obviously um, that's not always possible or practical. Um, ideally though, if you were exporting to a format like this from a more rich sort of package like this in vivo package, um, you might want to um, document the originating software used um, to sort of like assist in that loss of context, at least to provide information to a future user. It's like, okay, well, here's how this data set in CSV format was created. Um, 
here's what some of these qualities might mean coming out of this originating software package. And at least they could um, make the link between those two things. Okay, so scenario two. Um, so during a consultation uh, with a faculty member who is very close to retirement, um, they bring you a flash drive which contains a 20 gigabyte zip file, uh, which they say contains 20 years of their data um, measuring nutrients and fresh water. Um, and so you uh, take that zip file, you extract it, um, and you find a dozen unnamed file folders that they tell you correspond to funded projects. Um, and then within each of those folders, there's hundreds of files, uh, many with multiple versions or drafts of those same files. So in terms of thinking about how you're able to support uh, that request to preserve and to share that data, uh, you could consider keeping all of it, maintaining its current organization as the researcher had, had used it in. Um, you could try to curate it, for example, by keeping you know, the more recent or complete versions of files. Um, or you could, you know, depending on your own skills or capacity to support this request, you might uh, suggest that you don't accept it. So it, when you think about um, keeping it all, uh, in terms of making that decision, I would think about a few different uh, criteria. Um, so uh, does the current organization of the data set in its current organization, does it support, uh, support discoverability and reusability of the data that it contains? Uh, there's lots of files that could potentially go into uh, a data set, but not every file is necessarily useful or of value. Um, and if the organization does not support or actually uh, hinders uh, discoverability or, or reuse, from the curator point of view anyways, I would question the value of, of sharing it. Um, as a creator, I also think about uh, data set size. So do we have the storage to allocate to that large uh, a data set? If not, all of those files are absolutely useful. Um, and then also what are the implications of file size on reusability? So depending on the platform you're using, if you're, for example, if users have to download uh, files over HTTP, uh, 20 gigabytes is a long download and that will impact the ability for others to reuse the data. Um, but those sorts of uh, requirements related to FAIR aren't the only considerations. There are also requirements that researchers face that may require all of this information uh, to be kept or made open for some amount of time. So requirements from institutions, funders, or publishers. Um, so it's, at some level, uh, you might want to support that, but perhaps the data repository is not necessarily the best place. That's right. And so these concerns essentially extend into the preservation environment, maybe down the down the road time wise. Um, when you have complex uh, materials with lots of um, folder structures, um, users need to figure out what these are. <laughs> um, you can't presume they can just call up the researcher who may be long gone at that point and figure it out. Um, and we'll touch upon it a little bit later on, but there's this principle of independent understandability in um, sort of preservation standards and ideas where um, members of the community that the, the archive is designated as being able to access these materials should be able to, to understand them independent of the original creator or even the archivist to process them. Um, and so, you know, with complex collections like this, you do have to put effort into documenting the structure and relationships between the files. Um, similarly, when you have these complex hierarchies of different kinds of materials, it could be complicated to maintain access or rights provisions for different pieces um, when there may be certain things that are closed or um, aren't um, under the same sort of rights framework as materials that are intended for like public use and reuse. And similarly, of course, um, the more you have um, and the larger size of files, both require greater amounts of preservation resources in terms of storage needed, a processing capacity, and then the human capacity too to just monitor all this stuff. Um, so then if you're then leaning towards not keeping all of it for some of the reasons we, we covered, um, entering that process of kind of selection and appraisal of, of those files um, as kind of a curator, the first consideration that comes into my brain is, is what constitutes a data set. Um, of those, I think it was 12 uh, folders, um, are they related? Is that a single data set um, or could it be broken out to make uh, those 
the data more usable and discoverable. Um, and in terms of considerations to prioritize, if you're selecting um, files over others, um, prioritizing uh, complete data over partial data or publication data. So in the generation of, of uh, data and uh, uh, relating that to a publication, if some of that data is separated out into multiple files to you know, support figures or tables, um, pre preferentially selecting those the complete uh, files uh, is preferred. Um, if you're making selections as well, uh, raw data over processed data um, is preferential as well um, because that's obviously more uh, reusable and pre-processing or processing can be described in terms of documentation and reapplied to that, to that raw data. Um, and then also selecting data that support uh, published uh, publications or published conclusions over unpublished conclusions. Um, and then also the organization of that data can also inform uh, selection and appraisal as well. So if the, the file structure and naming conventions are uh, already you know, in place, obviously that's a lot less um, work that you need to do as a curator to clean up those files. So that also comes into consideration uh, when, when selecting what to, what to keep. All right, so um, the same sort of principles apply on the preservation end as well um, when it comes to selection. So when you have, let's say, a segment of that published complete um, data maintained in a public repository, um, that can have consistent cross-collection preservation policies applied. Um, whether that's at like the bit level or you know, migration normalization approaches, um, it makes uh, it much easier to say, okay, everything in this repository we're treating in the same way um, because it's of the same kind. Um, then, of course, you know, those unpublished raw and complete files um, may have other kinds of value. They may have um, provide evidence of that researcher's process, um, their thinking. Um, and if you know, the university archives of that institution or the researcher as a faculty member sees that as valuable, maybe those would be a good candidate for acquisition um, there. Um, but this, I think the interesting dis thing to distinguish is sort of the different functions that those materials play. Um, that published data set, let's say, or set of um, data um, are intended for reuse. They're intended as sort of like authoritative copies of the data that informed a person's research. Um, and could be reused in a whole bunch of different contexts. Um, the other sorts of materials that might end up in the archive um, could be, you know, uh, reused in the context of like a study on research practice um, or for history of science and technology projects. Um, but they perform sort of, they perform different kinds of functions, I think. Um, and it's much easier to apply different preservation and access policies when they're kind of separated out a bit more carefully. Um, when it comes to organization, um, just having things like consistent naming conventions, um, consistent structures are easier to parse and interpret from a systems perspective. If you're maintaining um, management systems for these kinds of materials, preservation management systems. Um, and of course, it's also just easier for, for users to understand them as well um, long into the future. Yep. All right, sorry, I was on mute. Um, scenario three. So. Um, you are uh, the curator of a, a Dataverse uh, repository uh, and you receive a notification that a data set has been uh, submitted for review. Um, and the title is Replication Data for uh, Biodiversity Assessment of Canadian Wetlands. Uh, so you proceed to open the data set and review uh, its contents. And what you find are four CSV files uh, that are titled Figure 1 to, to Figure 4. Uh, so based on the data set title and those file names, you can probably assume that the data set is related to a publication and that the authors are likely looking to deposit data underlying their figures to support some publication requirement. Um, there is no other documentation. Um, however, the variable titles in those files are moderately um, descriptive. Um, and then in the kind of covering metadata, only the uh, minimum uh, metadata, the required metadata are, are completed. So as the uh, repository manager, do you choose to accept and publish this data or do you return it to the author for more work? Um, and so yeah, as, as someone in this situation, um, sometimes it happens, um, it's a tricky choice, at least I feel that way, because on the one hand, 
Um, our institutional data repositories are there to support researchers, at least in part, uh, to support them in uh, complying with public publisher or granting requirements. And you don't want to impede that objective. You know, researchers are busy, they have a lot of work to do, and you know, they're just trying to, to meet these obligations. Um, but then, you know, as the as the repository manager, you're assuming responsibility for a data set that does not necessarily fulfill the open science goals underlying those requirements. So it's a tricky balance of not trying to kind of impede um, someone's work, but also trying to improve um, the likelihood that that data can be understood and, and reused. So in terms of, of uh, if you were to return that data to, to the author for improvement, um, in terms of additional metadata that I would be looking for, um, this, in terms of the citation data, which is kind of covering at the, at the data set level, um, I primarily look for information that can support uh, discovery. Um, and then in this particular case, because it is probably related to a, a publication, um, the, the related publication should absolutely be referenced by its uh, persistent identifier, so the, the associated DOI, that should be absolutely included uh, in that uh, metadata, for one, because there's no other documentation provided in the data set. So hopefully that related publication can provide some of that, that context. Um, so they should be connected. Um, and then in terms of other uh, file level met metadata that you could request, there are three types to, to consider to support uh, understandability and reusability. So uh, there's descriptive metadata, which you know, describes the content and context of, of the data. So um, that would be a, for those CSV files, for example, uh, variable uh, dictionaries. Um, there's also administrative uh, metadata. So that's information uh, needed to use the files. So for example, software requirements for uh, accessing those files. Um, and then there's also structural metadata. So how do those different data sets relate to one another or do they relate to one another? Um, that can also help support um, understandability of, of those files. Um, and the wonderful thing is that we need all these things, ideally, um, in preservation management systems as well. So if they, they exist already in the repository from which we are pulling packages for preservation, ideally that information will then flow um, quite seamlessly into the preservation repository. Um, and in the preservation world, we have um, two interlocking standards called METS and PREMIS, which is a, both XML-based standards that are designed to hold this kind of information about digital objects that you're looking to preserve. I um, mean, pr preservationists commit to maintaining both the digital objects you want to keep, but also the metadata about them, because that context obviously is extremely important. So um, it, all to say is if this information exists, it makes the preservation likelihood much, much greater. Um, similarly, there are also um, lots of abilities to, to preserve relationships with other kinds of materials um, and, and possibly even think about um, ensuring that there's preservation for, for those related materials. So if you have a data set within a you know, data preservation repository here, you might also wanna check that the accompanying publication is preserved by somebody else. And there are ways to do that so if you're aware of these relationships between objects, um, those can be documented for preservation purposes as well. Yeah, and then um, in terms of um, documentation that you might also want to request, um, Grant mentioned earlier this idea of independent understandability, um, thinking about what sort of uh, material or information uh, would be necessary to provide context to support that understandability and appropriate reuse um, of that data. Um, and a lot of that documentation can be really time consuming or challenging to uh, recreate or create following investigation. So thinking about um, kind of the time span, um, getting that as soon as possible is, is important and that could also affect your, your decision about when to, to publish. Um, and yeah, so independent, as I mentioned, independent understandability is key to preservation standards um, and auditing of preservation repositories. Um, that's one of the commitments that um, repositories should make. Um, and so standards like OAIS, which is one of the key digital preservation standards, um, mention it frequently. So um, it's really hard to ensure without this contextual documentation and information. 
Um, and documentation too of the type um, like readme files or other kinds of perhaps like unstructured information is also very helpful, particularly when it comes to documenting dependencies like software or code used. Um, because it really can help the preservationist understand what sorts of things they also may need to consider as part of the preservation package, whether that's additional software that they may need to link to or be aware of or actually preserve itself um, or other kinds of connections. Uh, again, those sort of layers that are required in order to navigate and maintain accessibilities to files um, and inform things like migration and emulation strategies. All right, so our last scenario covers considerations for licensing. So uh, during an audit of recent submissions to your uh, university's data repository, you find a data set uh, that proposes a new method of seismic response prediction for building structures. So the data set includes a piece of experimental software, which allows users to specify a range of inputs to model outcomes. Uh, there's a historical data set of seismic events um, which is used, I presume, as an input to that model. Um, and then a readme file that describes that the data set uh, was created for academic purposes. Um, however, um, in the uh, repository, at the repository level, um, the license setting of uh, CC0 or Creative Commons uh, Zero license uh, is enabled, um, but then no uh, licensing information is specified really in any of the other documentation. So would you recommend to just leave it as is, um, or would you contact the author for clarification? Um, and so um, because there is kind of that inconsistency where in some of the documentation, it talks about the, the software being created for academic purposes, um, and you would think about um, what sort of support do you want that license to confer to uh, both creators and, and reusers uh, of, that, of that data? Um, so um, in terms of supporting the creator, you want to make sure that the license that is applied uh, supports attribution for their work, um, which can further you know, their, their own research impact. Um, and the license should also be, uh, should specify any uh, limits that need to be imposed on reuse and distribution of, of that software for, for reusers. Um, and then licenses can also manage risk and liability for creators. Um, so in this specific instance, um, it's uh, the data set contains software that could have some industrial application. Um, and even though the README states that it's created for academic purposes that, that might conflict with the CC0 license that's been left on. Um, and so uh, Creative Commons licenses are actually not recommended for software. There are other permissive licenses that usually include some sort of warranty disclaimer. Um, and so thinking about all of those sort of uh, considerations would um, help determine whether you should get in touch with that uh, author for, for clarification. Um, and similarly, uh, these sorts of considerations should flow into preservation systems as well. Um, ideally, access and other kinds of rights-based issues should be documented in preservation systems. And there's a component of the digital preservation metadata standard um, um, called Premise, which I mentioned before, which has a rights piece that um, lays out the structure for how you're actually supposed to keep information around rights. Um, and ideally, these things um, would be monitored over time um, and acted upon um, as required. Um, similarly, ensuring that these things are documented is a key part of repository certification standards. So if there isn't awareness uh, about rights management um, in relation to particular data sets that are being preserved, um, it is difficult to meet, to meet those basic certification standards. And then finally, in terms of thinking about licenses, I also think about uh, what rights I have as the data or the repository administrator. Um, what rights do I have um, in relation to, in, to the data sets? Um, and those aren't necessarily always applied at an individual data set level. Those can be applied, um, say, in the terms of use for the repository or in any sort of policies that you've created um, that uh, depositors have to comply with. Um, so thinking about what permissions um, do I have to improve metadata um, over time, 
or permissions to uh, migrate uh, data sets, perhaps if our platform uh, or service model changes. Um, and then also permissions for future deselection. So um, storage is not infinite. Um, what sort of uh, ability do I have to uh, deselect uh, or choose not to retain that data uh, in the future? Yeah, and so these considerations don't go away with preservation either. Um, as somebody responsible for you know, preserving digital collections, um, I do often need permission to migrate formats. Um, and perform other kinds of preservation functions. And normally you would find um, these sorts of terms in like terms of use for certain repositories. Um, that tends to be where it's covered, but it could be indicated elsewhere as well. And a key area that's sort of touched upon by this scenario is that um, if there's software um, that's a dependency that could be used for like an emulation strategy, um, that would have to be truly you know, open um, and available for future use by anybody um, for preservation is to use it, let's say, to present both the data and the software together in like an emulation environment. So um, there are these sorts of, of considerations that preservations have to make to say, okay, are we permitted to make changes to files to serve things um, up to users in certain ways um, beyond just like access rights um, to make things available, available broadly. All right, so we've reached the end of our adventure. <laughs> Um, some takeaways. These are just some, some summaries that came to mind from the two of us. So we talked over these issues ourselves. Um, one is that the principles of reusability really do broadly support preservation. Um, the two are obviously connected. Um, and ideally, um, thinking about reusability, reusability in an intentional way does assist in preservation down the line. Another is that putting the effort in at the time of deposit and creation really ensures that that technical debt is not deferred to a point where it can't be easily repaid. Um, the idea of te technical debt is that um, it comes out of software development in particular. If there are things wrong with a piece of software and you don't address them, eventually that debt kind of accrues until it does have to be addressed. Um, and I think the same can be said about um, data curation um, and how that relates to preservation. So, um, that brings us back to this idea of preservation prospects. Um, if you think about a data set that's poorly documented and contextualized, wasn't appraised or selected for long-term value, um, either for reuse or sort of broader research value, it has files enclosed or proprietary formats and unclear, undocumented, muddy rights. Um, what do you think its prospects will be? Super good, <laughs> like super bad. Um, and in particular, will that data steward, whoever it is, um, over time, um, will they prioritize it in terms of their resource commitments for preservation and access? So if they need to do all this sort of um, work later on in order to make files accessible and it's costing a lot of money or it's taking a lot of, up a lot of space, that may inform um, decisions around deselection as well. So um, putting in the effort at the beginning is essentially good karma <laughs> um, and uh, hopefully allows, allows your data set to take that leap into the unknown. So, um, we wanna thank you very much for taking time in your day to, to talk about these workflows and these leaps into the unknown. Um, and we have just a few minutes left for questions. So <laughs> we'd be happy to, to talk over some things now and also um, we can respond to others after the webinar later as well. Thank you so much, Shahira and Grant. Um, we do have some questions lined up. So the first one I have on my list is from Eugene. And Eugene, you should have the ability to unmute yourself now. Hello, thanks everyone. Uh, it's a great presentation. Uh, yeah, you're well done and uh, well pieced. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Grant and Shahira. Um, I'm coming to it from a different angle now. Uh, just being an administrator, I can see and I could feel how much uh, uh, time it takes to um, preserve and I can see that it's very time intensive process. Um, and, and the question is how much time we can devote uh, uh, to, to preserve the data well. So my question is, it's a bit controversial, but my question is why not preserve everything? Uh, preserve everything as my, uh, to the best uh, ability as uh, we can and, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, try to do it centrally um, so uh, we can, uh, uh, we can uh, centralize the costs uh, for the institutions in one place, but uh, try to do it in a large scale. Thanks. I think that's, I think that's a great 
a great you know point. Um, it is very time consuming and costly, and the current I think arrangement where there is you know one or a few uh, data creation or preservation librarians that are meant to serve their entire university like that does not scale. So I think that um, on that point, you know, sort of combining skills or or capacity across institutions is, is a good suggestion. I'd also like to see like software be developed that helps kind of walk researchers over time, like through creating better data um, so that by the end of the investigation, hopefully it is, you know, well, well documented and, and described. Um, and then hopefully like data management planning might help with that as well. Um, in terms of like why preserve everything or not. I mean, I think that, I mean, to the best of our ability, sure, but that we're also in a time and resource constrained world. So if you don't have a massive amount of storage to retain everything or um, don't have the time to like adequately put that work in, is it going to be reused? And then what's the kind of, what's the value of doing any of that work if, if, if the data itself can't be understood or reused over time? That's at least wearing my kind of curator hat, kind of questions that I, or issues I grapple with. Yeah, I, I mean, we've talked about this before, Eugene, um, in different contexts. So, you know, I'm obviously very interested in centralized ways of, of doing this work more efficiently, more effectively. Um, but if institutions want to take on the mandate for keeping things long-term, they do have to put in the work and they do have to invest in it. Um, if they're not interested in investing in, in preservation and curation, they shouldn't be doing it. Um, because there just isn't, I, like, I don't see the point of um, keeping things that won't have use. Um, libraries, archives, other memory institutions generally endeavor to keep their collections so that they can be used. Um, and if they can't be used, there's really no point. But to the point of like sharing labor, sharing resources to, this, to do this work more effectively in a centralized way, absolutely. Um, I think that's where this work is going. Um, there's obviously lots of interesting questions about the governance of that sort of work and how, um, how to cost these things out. And all, but those are achievable. <laughs> um, those, are, those are generally achievable with, with the right amount of commitment. So um, finding that commitment in the first place is probably the most important thing though. And it, just to check that I see Eugene's follow up in the, in the chat about preserving the entire like Dataverse network, for example, I think like going back to earlier on in the slide with those different levels of preservation. So like maybe you can do like bit level preservation for the entire Dataverse network, but those sort of higher levels kind of really do depend on better curation being put in up front. And, and so I'm not sure that the higher levels could be as widely applied, but I think at some level it could all be done. And that's what we're talking about right now is like certain, a certain sort of level of preservation perhaps for um, everything in the repository, again, at that bit level, because those commitments are just lower um, and it's easier in terms of resources to do. But then, um, you know, with a little bit more effort, perhaps a certain selection of those data sets could be subject to higher levels of, of preservation work. Okay, thanks so much for that. Um, a question from Tim Vines. How often does preservation require multiple migrations to new software formats? That's a great question. Um, also, I'm so glad you're here. I really loved your, your early sort of work on this subject area. I encountered it back when I was at UBC and it really informed um, a lot of my thinking since, so thank you. Um, so migrations have not come to be as frequent as initially anticipated in the preservation field. I mean, in part because um, people are generally starting to use more widely documented and used um, and open formats. Um, so in our um, journals repository, for example, most of the materials that we have are in the PDF or XML form. Those are great for preservation purposes. Um, they're widely used. I don't anticipate needing to migrate. Um, it's when you get into more complex um, uh, materials, particularly materials that are already out of date or obsolescent, basically, the, um, something like WordPerfect, um, not widely used, pretty easy to open still, but, you know, something you would want to consider migrating um, for, for at least for access purposes. Um, and those materials with lots of dependencies are the real um, sticky ones. Um, things like databases, 
um, in particularly databases created in proprietary software formats. Um, other sorts of complex objects like video games, which are difficult to like port from one format to another. Um, that's where the, the sort of work is happening now. Great, thanks Grant. Um, Shahira, you were you want to answer the question in the Q and A about depositing both in vivo files and transformed files? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think um, if you if you have the storage capacity to do that, then I think that's the best approach. I mean, um, I think Grant um, might have touched on that a little bit. That that's the, the kind of pre uh, preferred practice in terms of preservation to keep everything in the original file format, following that do no harm principle. But then also, yeah, exporting. Um, the data into more open file formats. Um, and then in particular, like with the in vivo context, we also kind of also need to think about what of the data objects in that workspace um, are most useful um, for, for reuse potentially. So um, if it's, you know, the input files, which would be like say interviews or, or transcripts, exporting that, you know, those raw, uh, those raw um, files, um, is one possible um, way of getting reuse of those individual files outside of NVivo. Um, if it if what's useful is kind of the the derived um, data, um, that's obviously going to be more challenging. So understanding and thinking a little bit about what the kind of longer term uh, use value of that data set can also kind of guide what uh, level of effort you put into exporting uh, those files into alternate file formats. So something that uh, got a couple of questions going, a number of people, um, was scenario two about the retiring researcher. Um, the questions range from, is there anything that can be done from the policy level so that this type of scenario, we keep it all, but how can the data be useful to others, especially the person who's leaving? And then, you know, you get all these files, but you can't do anything with them. Could you hire students and train them to do the file naming work? I think the big question here, summing all of this up, is how do we intervene with faculty to get these processes happening sooner? Can we do that? I think I think we can, and I think it does take policy. So I'm, you know, hopeful that as you know, researchers are going to be required to share more of their data, whether through you know institutional policies or uh, or uh, journal policies that over time, there will be just better data management. And then that sort of, uh, like that will trickle downstream so that when they reach retirement, their data are well organized or maybe already shared. Um, but at the moment, um, I think, yeah, having some sort of like program where researchers can meet with you before they retire, like ideally many years before retirement. More than two weeks. Yeah, more than two weeks. <laughs> um, that's a tight deadline. Um, yeah, and then providing some of that sort of data rescue support, I think, is a value. Um, there's a lot of really valuable data that's been, you know, collected in in older digital formats or non-digital formats that could use um, or benefit from from library support. But it takes time um, in establishing that relationship with a researcher. So I don't think that just hiring students could be necessarily the answer because it takes the knowledge of that researcher to really make uh, that that data well described and, and reusable. Thanks. Yeah, it's interesting in the in the digital archives field, which is related in many ways. Um, archivists generally now are starting to have donor interviews um, well before something gets acquired by the archives, and often they'll ask the donors very particular questions about how they've organized their files, you know, what these things are, <laughs> um, and uh, all to help make an appraisal decision um, about what things they may actually accept. So uh, there are questionnaires you can find out there. Um, which kind of help guide this work. And maybe some of that research and, and practice could be ported into, into this area as well. Great, thanks. Uh, just a couple more questions and then, uh, and then we'll wrap things up. Do you have any suggestions or tips when trying to decide whether to spend time rescuing older data, especially unfamiliar data? At what point do you decide to abandon the data entirely? Yeah. A big question. Um, I think it's 
going to be like context dependent. Um, and then also based on your own skills and capacity. So if you have experience in that research area, obviously that sets you up at a better advantage to, to do some of that heavy lifting. Um, if, you know, there's researchers you can draw on with experience, you know, either using those file formats or understanding the context of, of that data, um, that would be helpful too. Um, and then it's also kind of a question of like, the, it's hard to value data, you know, I think that kind of contravenes some of the like open science principles about, you know, trying to make all of research open, but uh, there's obviously a trade-off between like time and like uniqueness um, and other kind of attributes of that data. So going back to a couple of those slides where there, there were those like priorities of like, does it support like a publication um, or, um, you know, is it, you know, well documented and described already? And is it just a matter of like migrating that into like a digital representation? Um, all those come into come into consideration. So there probably should be like a framework developed. If there isn't already, that would be pretty helpful. Shahira, I know you do need to leave us to uh, hop off to another meeting. So um, Grant and I, and we have Beth Kazuk, who's our preservation coordinator here at Portage as well. So thank you so much. Um, and we'll continue on with the discussion and uh, you, you never know, we might be sending you some more questions later on. Yeah, I'm happy to follow up, you know, if there's an email to, to go around with unanswered questions. I just wanted to thank everyone for, for tuning in. Um, it was a pleasure to, to work with Portage and, and Grant on this presentation. So uh, thanks again. Thanks, Shahira. Yeah. So something else that's come up um, in the chat is the idea of how much resource funding and time should be going into things like data curation and preservation. Um, there are some guidelines out there that say 5% of research funding, some that say it should be 10% of research funding. Uh, any thoughts on that? I have not seen any hard guidelines on this area <laughs> yet. Um, from, and there are some estimations of um, processing time for digital archives that have been released. Um, I can follow up with those resources later on. Um, but yeah, I, I honestly don't know. I, I did see Eugene commented here about recommending about 10%. Um, so I assume that's based on some sort of research at UBC. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't have an answer otherwise. That's okay. No, I wonder I, if uh, that would have been a really good question for Shahira just before she left. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I would say as well in the, the looking around that I've done, I haven't seen a lot of really hard and fast rules at this point. Um, I mean, we do know that funders will provide money for these kinds of things as long as they are included in the budget. Um, but yeah, to what level can you go? Mm -hmm. I mean, there are basic um, resource requirements for storage. <laughs> so like, that's always question one. Um, but how big is, how big are we talking? Like kilobytes, gigabytes, terabytes, petabytes? Um, and so some of those conversations start there um, at storage quantity. Um, oh yes, thank you to Aaron also for linking to the RDM costing tool. Um, that is exactly what we're looking for. <laughs> thank you. And I think one of the things you need to consider, we've talked about before in terms of, you know, hiring students to do stuff is you know, not just the cost of personnel, but also the cost, or the cost of storage, but also the cost of personnel. Mm -hmm. um, you know, who is going to be doing this? If you have someone on your research team who's going to be doing it, what are you going to be paying them? Because you should be paying them. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, some labs are starting to hire people devoted to this as well, um, which is kind of neat to see. So somebody who's essentially in the essentially like records management, data curation, um, process management role um, within research units or labs um, with the intention of, you know, final products being the publishable data and publishable research, of course, too. So you can see those two kind of functions joining in interesting ways. So maybe that's a model for, for the future. Mm -hmm. I don't know if the uh, link that I dropped into the chat necessarily is related to how much money you should be spending on certain things, but it is an interesting new tool that's being developed by the Digital Preservation Coalition 
that attempts to create risk assessment models based on different preservation decisions and actions, which I believe does in, it incorporates money as, as a factor. So uh, it's not actually ready for public release yet. I did watch a demo video online and it looks like it's gonna be really interesting cool. and may, may be helpful in answering these types of questions. Thank you. Neat. Yeah, and thanks for all the resources you've been posting in, in the chat, Beth. Much appreciated. As soon as you said pronom, I thought, oh, we're dropping acronyms. We better start <laughs> putting links in there. <laughs> all right. Anything else before we wrap up? I don't think so. I think that's uh, all the questions that folks have right now. But I would imagine that we'll be re revisiting this issue, uh, this area, this world again in the future. Um, so thank you so much, Grant. And uh, again, thanks to Shahira for, uh, for her contributions as well. Um, we will be posting this up on YouTube um, in the next couple of days. I'm sending the slides around as well. And don't forget to register for next week's webinar uh, in the series on uh, the Whiskey uh, Project. Um, yeah, and on that, I will leave you all to the rest of your Tuesdays. Hope everything goes well and uh, take care until we see you again. Thank you so much. Much appreciated. <laughs>